Podcast. This is Jordan back with you. So the theme today is I want to talk about the horses that shaped me as a rider. Every great rider comes from riding great horses. You can't refine your skills and get super sensitive to horses if you're on horses that are maybe on the more naughty side or have more behavioral issues. You have to be able to understand what's going on in their heads and learn from horses that are steady eddies before you can learn to ride those horses that are a little bit more tricky. So the first horse I want to reach uh, start with today is good old Bo. I mentioned him a couple of times in my first episode so if you haven't watched that one yet go ahead and go give that one a listen after this one. We bought Bo for $400 out of what we like to call a horse trader's back pasture. We got really lucky because Bo ended up being the best old dude ever. I attribute this to the fact that he probably was ridden by a bunch of drunk people when he was younger. (laughs) And I cannot be more grateful for this horse. He, I used, I mentioned in the first episode that he used to stand with his head in a tree because I didn't know how to control him and make him go forward. So he would get away with murder because I couldn't do anything yet. But as I learned and got this and developed my skills and started taking lessons, Bo's skill level changed with mine for a while. When I first started riding Bo, he was perfect because he would take care of me. He was really relaxed and was like, all right, cool. We're just going to be bob around while you figure out what you need to do up there, kiddo. And then when I started asking him for the sitting trot and the canter, Bo kind of was like, uh, excuse me, what are you talking about? So I had to convince him that cantering was fun. He still to this day does not really enjoy cantering and I kind of know why now, but back then I just thought that maybe he just didn't have the training that was necessary. But he eventually came around and when I got decent enough with him at home, my mom decided it was time for me to start showing him. And when I started showing him, Bo did not like it that much. He was not very much a show horse. He, to this day, is still not the biggest fan of it. He's grown to be tolerant of walk trot classes, and he likes to do walk trot classes with little kids, but he does not like big classes. He doesn't like a lot of horses around him. He's definitely more the horse that wants to be by himself, believe it or not. I know horses are pack animals, and they like their big herds, but Bo is much happier having the big old round bale to himself and does not like having friends. So as I developed and grew, Bo, I realized, was not going to be a show horse, and my parents realized that as well. So we kind of bounced around a couple of horses, trying to find the right one, the perfect one for me. And that became a very difficult task because we had to find a horse within our budget that was able to handle a younger rider that didn't really quite know what she was doing yet. And that's why we bounced around a little bit because... We couldn't quite find one that was a good fit for me because I didn't have, I knew enough to be dangerous. I thought I knew what I was doing, but in reality, I didn't have the body control, the leg control, the hand control, and the horses I was riding would let me know that. And in hindsight, I can see that now. (laughs) But back then, I just thought, oh, it's the horse. Oh, it's the horse. My mom knew (laughs) that it wasn't the horse, but I was convinced it was the horses. Um... As I moved forward in my riding, I decided to quit the lesson barn that I was going to, and I got an internship with an amazing reining horse trainer in our area. I won't say his name directly, but he has been a huge mentor, and I've known him for easily the past, gosh, I think it's been eight years now, and I'm still in touch with him. And I check in with him, and I say, hey, guess what? I won this title. I won this show. I went to this show. My students are doing this. And we just compare notes now, and I've actually sent clients to him. He suggested clients to me when I was a professional. So it became this really awesome mentor-mentee relationship that eventually turned into professional-professional relationship in the long run. And to this day, I still keep in touch with him. He reached out to me the other day trying to see if I could help him out at his barn because he needed some barn help from someone he trusted, and he cho- he tried to reach out to me. Unfortunately, my 9 to 5 would not allow me to do that. Um, in the time frame that he needed me to. So sadly that didn't work out. But so back in that day, I, um, like I said, started an internship with him 
and part of the internship was I would wash and braid tails in return for a ride or two a week on some of his well-trained horses. And I specifically remember <laughs> he would only put me on this one gelding for the longest time, probably six months of my internship, I spent on this gelding that had a quirky lead. And by quirky, I mean he had some issues that led to him not really wanting to pick up the lead and the issues were being taken care of by vets. And so now he was able to do it, but he in his brain didn't think he could still because he thought it would hurt. So he, out of habit, would pick up the incorrect lead unless you were very clear with him saying, hey, you need to take this exact lead. And even then, he'd try and take the wrong lead just to start out. So he made me ride this horse for forever because my skill level needed to grow and this horse would be the horse to give me that refined feel of a horse and understanding where the body needed to be. In hindsight... <laughs> I laugh at myself because I was totally clueless on what true bend in a horse is and that kind of stuff. And he was trying to teach me, bless his heart, and I just wasn't getting it. And towards the end of our internship, I, I did get it eventually. I was ready to go on to college and I had already gotten my scholarship. So I had learned enough that I was good enough to go to college for riding. So. Even now, I look back and I'm like, wow, I grew so much just in those six months that I was his intern. And I'm so grateful for everything he taught me. And he eventually let me ride a couple other horses that had a little bit, they were a little bit simpler that I adored riding. But when we left, when, I, when we decided to part ways and I had to go to college and he needed to go on to find another intern... He said to me, you, you drove me crazy the first three months, but you turned out to be a good kid, and I, you can come back any time, and I'll give you some work. And he did. During the summers when I had um, some time off in school or when I had spring break and stuff, I'd go back and clean tails and braid tails, clean stalls, and ride horses for him. So, like I said, it turned out to be a really good internship and a really good relationship. That one was that that was more about the gentleman that I worked with necessarily than the horses. But that quirky gelding really taught me a lot about perseverance and getting used to a horse that knew what it was doing but decided to say, mm, nah, not today. Next up was the horses in college. Gosh, there was the college I went to had over a hundred and had about a hundred and twenty horses and obviously I didn't ride every single one of them. But I rode probably close to 80 of them, and of those 80, there are probably, um, gosh, three. Three that I can absolutely think of that really, really shaped me as a rider. The first one was a little quarter horse mare in the Western program named Holly. And I can say her name because I know she's still at that college, and I know she's doing amazing. And Holly is known as Hot Holly, if I remember correctly. She's a little bit sensitive. She's a good little mare. She gets um, gets a little fired up if you ride her a little incorrectly. But if you know how to ride her, Holly turns into this perfect little pattern horse for Western horsemanship. And she even did a little bit of reining, too. So she was just a little pocket rocket, but she was so much fun because if you asked her for something, you better be ready. She's going to give it to you. And she wanted to give it to you right away. So she would automatically like jump ahead and she'd try to anticipate what you wanted to do next. So Holly was that hothead, but we all loved her because she really taught you to be sensitive. Be, be careful with what you ask a horse. Don't do it too fast because if you do it too fast, you're going to get the response like that. But you might not want it at that speed. An example I had of a time when I was riding Holly was I was going down for it's I was going down alongside doing a straight line because in Western horsemanship your straight lines are super important. And this is my first ride on Holly. So trust me, it did get way better. I eventually started winning shows on Holly and actually competing on Holly, so it ended up going really well. But this was my first ride on her. My first ride on her, we were going down the long side trying to make a perfect straight line, and it was a jog, which is a very, very, very slow sitting trot, to an extended jog, 
and you have to show the difference. And me not being super refined yet and understanding, I took my legs and I gave her a good old bump, but not a big kick, just a bump. And Holly was like, whoa, and she took off right down that long side. And my coach was like, what are you doing? Slow her down. But Oh gosh, bless Carla. She dealt with me so well. Um, that coach was Carla Wenberg. She's actually still at St. Andrews University. She was probably the biggest influence in my life. And I was the luckiest person in the world to get to train under her and for her to believe in me and take me eventually on to two, two team national titles and one individual national title. But in that moment, that was a long way away because I couldn't even get this horse to stop. So bless Holly and bless Carla for dealing with me because <laughs> that was a hot mess of a ride, that first ride. But then as it went on, it eventually became my, my junior year, three years later, I was sitting there and I was riding Holly coming close to the nationals that we were going to go and compete at and we were having one of our last team practices and I was on Holly gosh, I still have a picture of our team posing with all the horses um, for the last practice before nationals. And sure enough, I'm sitting on Holly and coach looked at me and she said, you know, the change in you and this mare show you just how far you've came as a rider in just these last few years. Because I ended up becoming the person that would get on Holly and lull her back down from someone who maybe accidentally fired her up. And that's actually something that I pride myself in is I became the person that lulls horses to sleep and lost what we call the electrifying seat. I no longer had that, thanks to Holly. And I got so, I got so much out of that mare. I can't even, it kind of gets me all jittery. That's why I can't really get the words out, but I learned so much from her and the next horse that's gonna be in this, um, the next few horses from college, but the college, college is where that ability to lull horses quieter and settle them down and understand that it's okay, they can be chill, that foundation was built in college for me. I have two more horses to talk about for college, so hold on to your seats. Um, the next horse was a horse that, I gosh, I believe he's still there. I hope he is. He, he's got to be in his 30s by now. But when I was there, he was in his mid to late 20s, so he was an old man. His name was Thomas J, and I used to call him Tommy J or TJ, and God, that horse, he, so a little background on Thomas J, so you understand the kind of horse he was. Thomas J used to be a Grand Prix horse in his heyday. When he was young, Grand Prix, you know, the big jumps, the biggest of the biggest, and he eventually was donated to St. Andrews, and just out, just for retirement, they were done showing him and they wanted to send him somewhere good that he could continue education for young riders. And so he was in his mid to late 20s. And so he was a Grand Prix horse, but definitely retired. And he had what everyone else liked to call first jump-itis. So he'd come up to the first jump and without fail, he would stop with everyone. And then... I got on him and for some reason something clicked between me and him and to this day of all the rides I had on him he never refused a single jump and I would watch him refuse jumps with other riders but I would sit on him and sure enough I would just kick him on up right up to the first jump and up and over we would go and there was no problem and if you don't believe me, you can ask any of my old Huntsy coaches they'd be like yep Thomas J loved Jordan and that was her that was her baby. Um, and I would go out to the barn and I'd groom him on my own. But the trick with Thomas was if he didn't get the first jump itis with me, then he was like, sweet Grand Prix time. He'd want to get big, bold steps. And me being too clueless to understand that he was going so fast, I was like, woohoo, this is great this is awesome. This is where my love of show jumping came from, which eventually turned into a love for eventing. But so one particular story that I wanted to mention to you guys today about Thomas J was I was doing what was called uh, showing under the stars, which is where everyone in the college would get together and we would host a mini horse show. So at this horse show, we would get on our horses, we get to pick our horses and we would do different classes and compete. 
Well, I was doing what was called the 2-3 class, and I was on Thomas because I wanted to be on Thomas. And Thomas and I, it was a long, it was a diagonal line, and it was supposed to be seven strides. So that means the horse should be able to fit seven strides in between jump one and jump two in that line. Well, I guess supposedly me and Thomas got on a roll. And I mean a roll. This will explain to you just how big this horse's stride would get for the Grand Prix. We turned that seven stride into a five. So if you think about that, we cut off close to 24 feet with that horse's stride. Because the basic horse's stride is 12 feet. So if we cut out two strides, we made up 24 extra feet in his stride. So that was a little crazy. <laughs> Oh, man. I remember coming out and my trainer looked at me and was like, okay, that was cool and I'm glad you had fun, but please don't do that again. And I was like, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to. But Thomas and I were just having so much fun that that just kind of happened. And to this day, I still reach out to the college and I check on Thomas because some of my old coaches are still there and I just chit chat them up on Facebook Messenger and go, hey, how's Thomas J? And they'll just say, oh, he's good. And I think a couple of weeks, a couple months ago, I sent um, a little package of treats down there called Stud Muffins because I know he used to love them. So I hope they actually got to you guys. Let me know if they did, if you're listening. Um, otherwise... The next horse that I wanted to chit chat about was a horse that I met in the dressage world. So I had one horse in Western that really shaped me, one horse in the hunter jumpers, and now we have a horse in the dressage land that really tr taught me a lot. Her name was Maggie. And for any of you listening who are from St. Andrews or know of the St. Andrews horse Maggie, she is quite the little character. She can be sassy, opinionated. She is your mare, your stereotypical mare. And she really taught me about being sensitive with my leg and being careful with my leg aids in the dressage saddle. And she really dealt with me because at that time when I was riding Maggie, I had no clue what the difference between hunt seat and dressage was. I didn't understand the actual difference between the seats and the balance and how you're supposed to sit. Obviously now I know the differences because I've done every I've done hunter jumpers and I've trained horses specifically for dressage. So I had to learn the difference. But back then, poor Maggie, she was only able to really deal with me and teach me the sensitivity to how my legs are because if you put your legs on a horse, all that if you put your legs on Maggie and you did it too quickly or you didn't half hauled enough and prepare her she would go ee! like a little squeaky toy and then either buck or do the actual transition but she would always make that little squeaky sound like we called it the squeaky toy and that was because she was like what the heck man you didn't give me any warning and so she really instilled in me this whole idea of you have to prepare your horse I remember because I used to ride Maggie so much my um my head coach, her name was Jackie Dwell. I do believe she actually just recently retired from St. Andrews. Thank you, thank you for everything you did for them, Jackie. You were an amazing coach and really made me fall in love with dressage, so thank you for that. But I do remember Jackie telling me about Maggie and was like describing dressage as you do 90% of your actual transition and your actual work is all setting your horse up for the next thing always half halting, always getting them off your leg, moving them sideways, backwards, forwards, whatever you needed to do to get them ready for the next move. And then 10% of your work is the actual ask. So she explained that to me with Maggie and it really clicked. And thanks to Maggie, it really instilled in me this idea of setting a horse up, which eventually turned into being able to not necessarily manipulate a horse, but prepare a horse that may not understand exactly what I'm asking prepare them so much that I basically spoon feed them the next thing that we're going to do. And that eventually made me really good for young horses and horses with behavioral problems because they felt comfortable dealing with me doing that stuff for them. So that's all the horses that I really want to shout out to from college. There's many, 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 many more that I got to ride. Like I said, I rode probably close to 80 horses in college, 80 different horses, not 80 times, but 80 different horses in college. 
and they all had a huge impact on me and I love them all but those are the three that I felt really shaped me as a rider and I only have don't worry I only have um about five more horses to talk about I know it sounds like a lot but I'll try and roll through them but post-college horses that really influenced me I'll start out with my <laughs> my spunky mare that I also mentioned I believe in my last episode Torliani Tortellini Noodles whatever you want to call her I affectionately used to call her Gigi, so I don't know where that one came from, but eventually it became Noodles. Um, but I got Noodles as a young thoroughbred, off-track thoroughbred mare, and she was, I believe she was seven when I got her, and she was raised by an amazing off-track rescue rehab center called Jumping H Farm, shout out to Nicole Hutter up there. She is amazing. She brings in horses that maybe need some rehab and some let down time from the racetrack. And she works closely with Turning for Home. So shout out to her because she will take in the horses that need that extra little bit of love and put the extra mile in to find them the perfect home. And I got so lucky that she decided that Torliani was perfect for me because she eventually let me actually adopt Torliani, who actually wasn't supposed to be up for adoption, and somehow I wiggled my way in there to adopt her, and I I completely am grateful for that, that Nicole did that for me, and Torliani, the biggest thing she taught me was something that I actually learned from one of, uh, a trainer I worked with who's from Great Britain, and she explained to me that when you're working with a mare like Noodles was, you have to learn to be the bigger person. You can't let her own you, be the boss, beat you up. You can't beat yourself up when she's just being sassy. Because mares are sassy. They will be the ones to do things just because they want to. And that was definitely Torliani. She would be the one that she knew exactly how to push my buttons to get me to stop and get off because I would get so frustrated that I actually had to learn how to get over that and make her get over it and that eventually led to what I what used to be was a power struggle between me and her and that doesn't work out for anybody when you're riding horses power struggles are not anything you ever want to deal with because it just ends out it just ends up poorly for both of you you both end up frustrated, you both end up confused, and you just you just need to quit before it happens. So she actually taught me to deal with that and be the bigger person. And she led me to learn how to, if a horse is doing something underneath you, be completely unreactive to the negative things. And that was exactly what she taught me. And oh my goodness, it was amazing because um, I really eventually learned that I had to be the bigger person So what Noodles actually taught me was I just had to learn how to deal with that. The next horse I want to talk about is a adorable little Palomino pony. And I won't mention names just for the owner's sake so that they don't feel the need to um, be called out here. But I had a little Palomino pony that I used to train that when she came to us, everyone kind of looked at us and was like, why did you buy this pony for this rider? And I was, me and the head trainer were kind of like, well there's potential here. There's a lot of potential between this rider and this pony. And if this pony can get to the point where this little rider can ride this pony and this little rider can get to the point where she feels confident enough to ride this pony, it's going to be an adorable, strong combination that's going to last this little girl a long time. And this pony really taught me a lot, believe it or not, about um, saddle fit, bridle fit, and how important all of that is to the training of a horse. Because we had issues with this pony, and then we fixed the saddle, we fixed the bridle, we fixed the bit, and a lot of these issues just dissolved like magic. And suddenly this little girl could really ride this pony and enjoy it and started taking lessons. And if I'm not mistaken, now they're actually competing and doing baby horse trials. And oh my goodness, this pony was such a huge impact on my life because it was that first time that I saw something from point A to the goal, the end goal, point B. And that was such a huge impact on my training ability. And I got to luckily keep training this pony even after the little girl got to start riding her. But this pony was just, she also 
gave me so much confidence and I started eventing on this pony for the first time. I did my actual very first event on this pony and I did multiple events on her and I actually think she's one of the, if I'm not mistaken, she's actually the only horse I've ever truly evented on, did full a full three phase event on because she was so good and I just loved her. And she made me so confident because I knew exactly how she jumped. She was an adorable little jumper. She was fearless. I don't think that pony ever stopped at anything I pointed her at. And she was always game, always gung-ho. And she just taught me to go for it and follow something through. Because the results are going to be amazing. And that's something that, yes, you do need a great horse to teach you. Because that's not something that sometimes you can feel with those horses that are the, not necessarily deadheads, but the steady eddies, and they know their job, and they're willing to do their job for you, but you have to start out with those horses that might not necessarily want to do the job for you, and that was definitely that pony. She definitely started out being the type that, I don't want to do the job. I don't want to. She was definitely a pony mare. She was a, yeah, exactly, a pony mare. You heard me. Pony mare. Ponies, evil. Mares, sometimes evil. So, pony mare, evil. Um, but she ended up being the most perfect, angelic little pony ever in the end. And like I said, I was just really lucky to get to work with her. Next up was this little duo of two bay geldings. Once again, I'm not going to mention names just for privacy's sake and for the owners and I don't want to get that out there, but these two quirky bay geldings were so impactful because one of them truly taught me that you can take any horse from what it's stuck with, like whatever behavioral issues this horse has, if you put in the time, the patience, the work, the effort, you can make something great. You can fix them. They're not stuck like that. Everyone thought this horse was going to be stuck, that he was never going to amount to anything, that he was just going to have to go away. But when you put in the effort and the patience, and don't get me wrong, I lost my mind riding this horse on occasions. But this horse, he taught me so much about being patient and understanding and looking towards the end goal and looking back at where you started. Because there would be times where I'd ride this horse for a week and we'd get nowhere. But then I'd have to be reminded, but look where you started. And I guarantee you, there along that path, there were times where you'd ride him for a week and he would make you lose your mind. But eventually, he got better, and he got more comfortable, and I do believe he's actually been sold to somebody at this point, and I think he's doing really great. I haven't actually had a chance to catch up with him, but I think he's actually doing really great. And the other bay gelding I used to ride was one that came to us with some baggage, and it was another one that you have to be patient and deal with the actual retraining and understand that horses need to sometimes learn that when they've had a bad experience, the good stuff is coming. And they have to eventually learn that from you, that you're not going to hurt them, that they can trust you, they can trust your hands, they can trust your legs. And I had a horse that had to learn that from me. And I, like I said, I got really lucky because these two, in combina- these two big geldings in combination together really taught me a lot about patience and understanding the psychology of a horse. And I'm... I'm going to take that with me for forever. I actually might start crying a little bit here, but um, those two horses just meant so much to me because they really shaped me into this rider that understood and was fearless about getting on any horse and taking whatever that horse needed to do to me and understanding that it's not because of me. It's because the horse has some baggage and I'm trying to show him that it's okay. He can get over it. It's going to be different with me. And being patient and working through that process is something that I think every great rider needs to learn how to do because you're going to get amazing rewards from it. The last horse today I want to talk about is one that I actually was so blessed to get to lease her for a little stint towards the end of my professional period. And she really taught me how to love showing again. I went through a little time after college where I was coming down and decompressing from the championships and nationals and competing so much in college that I eventually got to a point where I didn't like showing. And it became such an anxiety-ridden thing for me that I actually eventually got to the point where I hated it. I didn't want a trainer looking at me. I didn't want anyone looking at me. I just want to take my horse in the ring and do it. 
and I hated being judged and looked at, but I still had to do it and get over it and go to shows because, hey, I'm a professional. You have to go to shows if you want to start getting your name out there to make your name known. Then eventually, once you're known, you can start doing showing less and doing more of the training. But I eventually hated it, and I didn't want to go. But I had to, like I said, because I had to put my name out there. And towards the end, there was a big bay mare who had an issue, had an injury. And I, my head trainer, my, my, manage, my manager, my boss, the owner of the facility, whatever you want to say, she was like, well, why don't you go ahead and just start riding Hannah. Oop, riding Hannah. Yeah, her name was Hannah. Sorry. Um, riding Hannah to start rehabbing her and start getting her going again. And so I did. I started walking her on, heel, on hills, taking her on trail rides, starting to build her back up from her issues. And I got really, I got really attached to her because she was such a loving mare. I had never experienced such an adoration in a mare towards a rider. And she would like nuzzle me. I'd come up to the upper barn and she'd prick her ears up and go, oh, do you have my treat today? Because she knew exactly who I was. And I started riding her more and she got to the point where she could do a little bit more. So I started doing trot work, canter work with her. And then my boss was like, well, why don't you start trying to show her? Because you need a horse to really get to get to understand and have a good horse under you so you can start to refine your skills. Hannah had a pretty good show record. She'd gone up the ranks in the dressage world and I was trying to get up the ranks too. So I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. And the next, in the next couple of weeks, Hannah came along really well. And my manager was, my boss was kind of like, well, why don't you just take her to the show? Pay the entry fees and don't have to pay any hauling fees. Just take her to the show. Do a little training level test. Get yourself back out there and see what you think. Sure enough, I go to the show. Hannah comes off the trailer and she goes right to eating grass. She basically falls asleep eating grass. I had been sitting on a bucket reading a book at this horse show. And this is the most chill horse show I had ever been to. My horse is just sitting there sleeping. I'm reading. And... I might tear up again. Um, but, but yeah, Hannah was just so chill and relaxed and I loved it. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I love, I love going out with this horse. And so we went home and I told my boss that I was like, God, I love taking her to a show because she was so chill, so relaxed. And I just, I loved it. And so it came up that there was a little show, a little schooling show that I was thinking about going to. And I kind of brought it up to my man, my boss. And I said, well, what do you think about me taking her here? And I could take some of the kiddos and I could do my class and she, they could do their class. I could coach them while I'm sitting on my horse. And because these kiddos are awesome. They knew exactly what they were doing. They just need a little bit of coaching saying, hey, why don't you do this, 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 fix your legs here, that kind of thing. So I ended up taking a couple kids and Hannah. And I went and I competed her at uh, my first first level test, actual in competition. I'd done up to second level maneuvers at that time. And I, Hannah was once again so relaxed and so lovely. And I just, oh gosh, it made me go, ooh, it made me so happy. And I just loved it. It made me want another one. It gave me that fix, but then I needed the next fix. And so, again, a couple weeks later, I was like, oh, hey, this show just came up. Can I get my buddy to go with me and we'll just haul out there together for the day? We'll come back. And is that okay? It'll only be like a six-hour thing. And she, my, my boss was like, yeah, load her up. Go. Go have fun. And sure enough, I did. And I loved it. And thanks to Hannah being very determined and being like, well, that's not right. I'm not going to do it for you if you don't do it right. I learned, I think I was doing some third-level maneuvers on her. And I was just so, this mare taught me so much. She helped me develop my counter canner seat, helped me develop half passes, side passes, um, canner half passes. We did a little bit. She had some issues, so she couldn't do that too much. But some canner half passes, some, um, some yeah, the half passes was the biggest thing that she taught me from third level. And I got just so much refinement from her that I was able to take to the other horses I was training, and they grew exponentially when I started riding Hannah. So the big thing I want to point out with Hannah is it does take a good horse to make a good rider. And she made me a great rider because she taught me 
one, to love being on horses and being showing and out there. But she also taught me how to refine myself and understand that less is more. You don't need to always ask big. And that's when I really started to learn that stuff. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of horses and get you, let you guys know a little bit more about me. And I hope you guys got a lot out of this because this is a very vulnerable thing for me talking about the horses that really shaped me. And I'm sure you could hear there were several times where I started choking up a little bit because these, these horses meant a lot to me and it hurts me that I don't get to see them a whole lot anymore. Um, but yeah, so we are on all of the social media handles, all under Clopcast or Clopcast Podcast. We are officially on Spotify and officially on Apple Podcasts. Hopefully this will be coming out there soon. And I hope to see you guys there soon. Also, if you have any suggestions, ideas, you can send an email to clopcastpodcast at gmail.com. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.